Welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain. Uh, truly excited about today's show, and uh, this is the issue of our time. Louisiana has the highest incarceration work rate in the world, and by far way higher than the next closest state. We have a crisis, but we have two people here that uh, can intelligently discuss uh, what's going on on the juvenile side, the adult side. We have Ms. Dana Kaplan. Welcome. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. She's with, uh, our Executive Director of the Juvenile Justice Project. And we also have Mr. Steve Singer of Loyola Law School. Welcome. Hi. Thank you very much. Uh, Pleasure appreciate to be here. having you. You, guys, you. you may not know these two, but they're, they're very, very prominent and uh, making a major difference. As we talked about earlier, there there are two people that have given their, their heart and their lives to um, uh, better conditions uh, for the community and the people. First of all, we're going to talk. Let's talk about. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, first yourself, uh, Dana, um, but then the Juvenile Justice Project, uh, New York to Berkeley, uh, history. <laughs> well, I, it's true. I'm originally from New York City, um, and uh, as we were talking before the show, I did my undergraduate at Berkeley, my graduate back in New York. But I have been working on the issues of criminal justice reform for. Uh, about um, 12 years now, uh, since, since my undergraduate days, really understanding that the policies that um, we have been uh, implementing in the United States criminal justice system, and in particular in Louisiana, are um, not only uh, negative for public safety, in that too often they don't produce public safety outcomes, but they are having a huge disparate impact on communities of color, and in particular, the African American community. And so um, I have been working for over a decade to try to promote policies that um, bring greater levels of justice and equity to our criminal justice system, but also to educate the public and elected officials in particular on um, what the negative impacts of the criminal justice system have been. Fantastic. Uh, two things. Uh, before we talk about the Juvenile Justice Project it, it, it itself, help us understand the word justice. Well, uh, it, it's, it's unfortunate that sometimes, um, you know, when we speak about the justice system, the, I think the, the, a lot of, the experience that a lot of people are conjured to mind is the injustices that they have experienced um, when they have come up against it. So too often our justice system is about whether you have money, whether you have clout. Um, there are studies that show that there are uh, disproportionate racial impacts at every stage of the justice system. So um, if a black youth and a white youth are picked up for the same offense, that as they move through the system, that black youth will be more likely to be convicted, more likely to be sentenced to a longer sentence, more likely to be sentenced to incarceration rather than a community-based alternative or community program. And I think those are the types of inequities that um, we are aiming to address uh, so that we can see justice um, actually begin to regain its original concept. Fantastic. And this institution, this, this organization, this Juvenile Justice Project, tell us a little bit. The Juvenile Justice Project of Louisiana was founded almost 15 years ago, and it was at a time in which Louisiana was unfortunately making uh, headlines for having one of the most violent and brutal juvenile justice systems in terms of conditions in the facilities and one of the um, most ineffective systems of juvenile indigent defense. So JJPL was founded to um, work to improve conditions in those facilities and advance juvenile justice reform. Um, Fifteen years later, we have seen some real improvements in our justice system, but we have a long, long way to go. And so we continue to monitor conditions in the current facilities, um, try to promote uh, best practices and policies that work, funding for alternatives to incarceration, um, mentoring uh, intervention programs. Uh, we also now work in the school system to um, increase the graduation rate and reduce the number of suspensions, expulsions, and dropouts so that kids are never entering the justice system to begin with. And we also um, do some work targeting kids in the adult system and um, conditions and practices there. It's fantastic. Uh, I always think about the Youth Study Center. Mm -hmm. I grew up right around the corner from it, and uh, uh, I was scared to death of that place. I, I never mm -hmm. forget. You know, I was a wayward kid. You know, so mm -hmm. I always figured it was a high probability of finding myself in there, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, because everybody that came out would talk about how horrible it was mm -hmm. on the inside. 
And I think the Youth Study Center is uh, an example of how important it is to have organizations and community members uh, engaged on what's happening in facilities. When that um, detention center reopened after Katrina, it was more than 50% flooded. Uh, it opened and we were um, visiting kids who were um, having significant mental health issues, no treatment, um, getting spoiled milk, rotten food. Um, it was vermin infested, there was mold and mildew on the walls, um, a lot of incidents of violence in the facility. And uh, at the time, we partnered with Holland and Knight um, and filed litigation on conditions in the facility, but also worked with a lot of different youth uh, and community organizations around the city to kind of bring attention to the issue, to the media, to the city council, to the mayor's office. And I am uh, very happy to report that now, five years later, the um, city of New Orleans has a consent decree with the facility. The kids are in school for full school days. Um, there is an increased level of social work counselors, um, mental health programming, better food in the facility, more staff. Um, and there are plans in the works for a new, uh, a new facility to replace the old one. So I think it is great to see that change. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I don't know that that change would have happened without um, real sustained community mobilization and attention to the issues, which is why it is so important for us all to, to be involved and to care about what is happening in these juvenile centers, um, in these adult centers. Understand that um, when there are unconstitutional conditions of confinement for the kids and adults in these facilities, um, not only is it terrible for them and their families, but it also uh, leads to further crime. Um, it negatively impacts public safety long term. So it's on all of us to care about it. Hey, man. Awesome, awesome, awesome information. Awesome. And, and uh, Mr. Singer, Steve, um, you're with Loyola Law School, but you um, helped put the Public Defender's Office back up after Katrina. Tell us a little bit about it. That's correct. Um, yeah, after uh, prior to Katrina, most of the funding for the Public Defender's Office came from fines and fees through the court system on uh, local criminal offenses in, and including traffic offenses. Uh, of course, once Katrina hit, there were no people, there was nothing moving through the criminal justice system, there was no money, it completely dried up, and so the Public Defender's Office came pretty close to disbanding. It was down to about five lawyers and one director and one administrative person. And the chief judge at the time, Calvin Johnson, right. um, had previously worked in the same position as I'm at it. Loyola Law School now in the clinic. Right. And so he contact my, contacted myself and Loyola to seek assistance in the days after Katrina right. uh, in trying to rebuild um, that portion of the criminal justice system which was necessary for the system to operate. Um, and also, uh, quite frankly, the Public Defender's Office prior to Katrina um, was not that well run an outfit. It was not uh, regarded that highly in public defender circles and in criminal right. justice circles. And so part of that was also to sort of rebuild it, but also reform it right. and follow best practices. Um, because I'd come from a public defender's office in Washington, D.C. that right. had been following best practices for quite a while. Right. Um, and so I spent uh, the immediate period after Katrina from about 2005, uh, fall of 2005 till 2009, um, sort of leading the effort to restructure and rebuild the office. And I think. By the time uh, I left in August of 2009, we had gone from, like I said, five lawyers, one administrative person, and one director to um, over 50 lawyers and over 120 employees. Um, and for the first time, the office, the office didn't have, pre-Katrina didn't have even basic things like real offices. It just had a room in the courthouse. Wow. They didn't all have computers or voicemail or telephones. Right. Um, there were just sort of none, none of the modern elements of a functioning professional law office mm -hmm. existed, um, and now all of that exists. Question then. Uh, Judge Hunter, and was just publicized, Judge Hunter just uh, contracted uh, at least ordered what Karen Carter Peterson and all of the other politicians. Uh, tell us about what, what, what is going on? Well, what you have is basically a funding crisis, um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's existed for a long time. It, indigent defense, public defense work has always been underfunded. And one of the problems is, is that uh, the political powers that be in the system, both at the state level and at the local level, 
nobody really wants to face up to the real costs of their decision making. Um, as I think has been widely reported and most people know, um, our, new, our recently elected, uh, within the past couple of years, District Attorney Leon Canizero mm -hmm. um, has been much more aggressive about bringing cases. He's brought, uh, I think uh, uh, it was rec recently reported in the last year, felony case filings in criminal district court are up about uh, 6,700 cases uh, increase uh, over the previous year. He's bringing more cases to trial. Um, he's bringing uh, more serious charges. He's been much more aggressive. Um, and of course, and, and so, and we have a new police chief, a new mayor's administration, and they've been trying to be very aggressive about attacking crime. Of course, when you attack it from a law enforcement angle, that creates costs. And one of those costs is you have to provide for counsel for all of those cases and clients and people um, who are now charged. Um, and, but the system hasn't wanted to face up to the real costs of all of these decisions um, by fully funding the office. Yeah, I went down, I was at court, you know, helping a young guy. He was, you know, some bum charge. It, they, police decided to take everybody to jail on something nutty. And this guy, uh, his public defender didn't even show up. So he was literally standing in court alone. Uh, and then they asked somebody from Tulane's law school to, uh, to represent him, and they, then they would have the students. It, it's almost as if we have a zoo going on now. Well, I think what you have right now is um, a, uh, a situation where the Public Defender's Office had been warning for almost a year now. The, the Chief pub, tub, Public Defender, now Derwin Bunton, has been warning, meeting with and warning both the local officials and the state officials that of this impending crisis over the, over the past uh, months. Uh, uh, and um, there have certainly been letters and meetings, but now we're finally at that point. No one, no one has really finally addressed the crisis, and now we're at that point where the Public Defender's Office, um, although it had been steadily increasing in size uh, since Katrina, um, now we're at that point where funding has not kept pace um, with the need, and now they're at the point where they're having to lay off attorneys uh, I, I'm sure the situation that you saw in court was a situation where not an actual public defender, but the public defender's office sometimes contracts out where there are multiple defendants and there are conflicts. They contract out with private attorneys, and it was probably a situation where one of those private attorneys didn't show up because they knew that they weren't going to be paid because the public defender's office has already announced that they can't afford to pay um, even the bill, some of the 200,000 of the bills they already have. Right. And so no one showed up, and so now you have a situation where you have a case and multiple cases that can't move forward because this, neither the state nor local officials have fully funded the public defender's office to the level it needs to be funded. Okay. All right. We're dealing with communities, and uh, we had Peter Shaw on from Tulane, Dr. Shaw. He was mentioning that we may... In some communities, we may have almost like 70% of African-American males locked up in jail. I mean, it, it's huge in, in, in some areas, like Lower Ninth Water, you know, uptown in mid-city, where, where you've decimated whole communities, like a, a, a bomb, Hiroshima, a bomb just went off and you have families that are left without young men. Um, all of these systematic um, policy issues are literally killing folk. I mean, you know, it, it, I'll, I always wonder, does, do we really see the magnitude of what's happening on these little budgetary issues? You know, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think we do. I think it is a big problem, and I think your description of the problem is um, very apt. Um, I think it's, it, it's accurate. Uh, I think the, uh, one of the problems is uh, that there's such a focus on getting tough on crime and having immediate results in terms of getting tough on crime that we lose sight of the big picture and the long-term consequences of what you described at the beginning, the fact that it's not just that Louisiana currently has the highest incarceration rate in the world. We've had the highest incarceration rate in the world for decades. Yeah. And as everyone, as anyone knows, I mean, we've had it, you know, we're talking since like the 80s, we're talking 10, 20, 30 years we've had the highest incarceration rate. It's not exactly like we ha don't have a crime problem as a result in New, in New Orleans. So the problem is, is that high incarceration rates over the long run simply increase 
um, the need for more incarceration and increase the crime rate over the long term because of exactly what you describe, it decimates whole communities. The I think Pennington the other thing, situation, yeah. It adds to the situation. And the other thing that people, I think, don't see unless you do what you did, which was actually go down to the courthouse and see what's going on, is we're all aware of the very high murder rate in New Orleans um, and violent crime. But in actuality, um, if you look at the long-term, at the recent even long-term trends, um, the actual overall crime rate, both in the United States and in Louisiana and in Orleans Parish, is actually going down. Mm -hmm. Yet we're prosecuting more and, in and incarcerating more. Um, and I think the, the problem is, is that people don't see what you saw by going down to the courthouse, which is there are surely um, a number of Real, case, real cases involving violent criminals that need to be prosecuted, that can and should be prosecuted, and involve incarceration, even lengthy incarceration. The problem is that what people don't see is that the great bulk of the cases down at the criminal district court do not involve that. They Garbage. are small time petty offenses. Garbage. They are things that, we, that should not even be in the criminal justice system. Right, exactly, cases that are that are just brought that bring the num there's too many cases that just bring the numbers up where either the police just arrest everybody and say well we'll let the court system sort it out later um, or the prosecution prosecutes everything to the hilt um, and doesn't carefully screen out the cases we have probably half my caseload in the clinic um, are cases that pre-Katrina would have been screened out and would have never been brought in the system and they don't deserve to be brought and they don't warrant the time and attention and the resources the limited resources devoted to them that are currently being wasted on those. And we need to focus on just a small number of real cases. You have that illustration about doing uh, Richard Pennington's office where they locked everybody up in what we're dealing with now. Right. I think that, that's, um, that, that you can see it over, over the decades of incarceration in Louisiana and in Orleans Parish. Um, what you see is, for example, Richard Pennington, who came from Washington, D.C., where I initially practiced in the indigent defense system there. And uh, there was a very, in the, in, the, in the mid to late 90s, there was a very tough on crime, very get tough, hardcore approach, arrest everybody, prosecute everybody in the system. And you did see an initial immediate drop in the, in the, in the crime rate, and it appeared to initially be successful. And that works well on a political timetable when someone's facing an election every four years. The problem is, is that then now 10, 15, 20 years later, we now are reaping um, the costs of that sort of system, which is you've destroyed families. Um, you now have children of those folks that were incarcerated, sometimes for long periods of time, on very small time petty offenses. So they grow up in single parent families, without a father, without an adult male figure, without a breadwinner in the family to earn. Um, and so now those children are now growing up and they've grow, grown up in these impoverished environments that have been destroyed in these impoverished communities. And what you get now is now a return of the cycle of violence. And if all we do right now with our current cycle of violence is do the same thing we did in the late 90s, we will repeat that. We will see us a, 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 an immediate dip in crime over the next several years. And then 10, 15 years down the road, we will be looking at the same problem again. Okay. I, you know, the, the, the fiscal costs of all this are, uh, are massive. I, there was a study done a few years ago that um, looked at just the cost of incarceration in Central City alone. And they said you could call Central City like a million dollar neighborhood because there's a million dollars spent right now to incarcerate residents of Central City at the state level. And you think about if we could invest a million dollars into the infrastructure of Central City, what a difference that could make. You know, we've been talking a lot this week about what the impacts are going to be of all these cuts to mental health programs right. coming from the state level. Right. And I think that there's a real concern about the consequences of that. But when we keep on saying, well, there's just no money at the state level, there's just no money at the state level, we have to look at, well, where is the money going? And we spend an incredible amount in Louisiana on incarceration. Right. So, you know, as a result of this, we've convened a sentencing commission which many other states have done mm -hmm. that have recommended kind of immediate uh, cost-saving sentencing reforms that would reduce the rate of incarceration and redirect millions of dollars back into the community. 
And this is the second year that the Sentencing Commission has met. And last year, a number of the proposals that went before the legislature either you know, went through as weakened, um, watered-down versions that because of, to a great extent, opposition from um, the Sheriff's Association, the District Attorney's Association at the state level, we uh, squandered an opportunity to save the state of Louisiana $75 million over the next few years. That was going to be um, in support of basic common sense uh, sentencing reforms that states around the country are implementing because they've understood that there's a better way to improve public safety. And so it's particularly frustrating to now this year see that we're going to have to cut the Office of uh, Juvenile Justice's intervention and mentoring programs once again. We are facing you know, huge cuts in mental health care because those are the types of programs that are so critical to the healthiness of our communities and the fabric of our communities. Right. And so you know, until we get our um, budget priorities in line, we're certainly not going to see the type of healthy communities that I think we all need. It's almost as if nobody's running the ship. It's as, it's as if there, there's no, nobody running the ship where it, it just keeps running the ground. Or a uh, person running the ship is only trying to take care of the better, higher income passengers mm -hmm. and, and everybody else is dying. Uh, next point. Going to jail, people imagine, okay, lock them up. But the conditions in the juvenile facilities and the adult facilities, um, how many times do inmates have to be raped and beat, raped and beat, raped and beat, and there's no recourse, there's nobody saying anything. Marlon Guzman is saying that, oh, we, 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 have, um, we, have the, we have the Hyatt Regency over there, nobody's hurt at all, and it, it's ludicrous, it's crazy. I mean, what's, what's going on? I think, unfortunately, at the state, and, at the state level um, and at the local level, we see some serious problems um, in juvenile and in adult facilities. Uh, I think anyone who has a family member or loved one who has spent time at Orleans Parish Prison can certainly attest to the fact that there are incredibly um, inhumane conditions of confinement at that facility. Uh, we have heard stories in just the, uh, this last week about uh, an incident at the Bridge City Center for Youth, which mm -hmm. was a facility that had made strides years ago. So it's particularly disappointing mm -hmm. to see um, violence and incidents flare up over there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this should matter to everyone yes. in the community. It is not just for the friends and family members of people who spend time there. Right. Uh, it is um, a human rights violation, and it also has huge consequences for public safety. If you send a child, or if you send an adult who has committed a low-level offense into a prison or jail, and they experience violence, if they experience sexual violence, if all they're exposed to is um, horrible conditions and, uh, and, and lack of mental health care that can actually further whatever existing problems there are, if you send them back out into the community afterwards with no support, we are contributing to our crime problem. And so this, for both um, the human rights principles, for the constitutional questions, um, out of basic common sense, and out of a commitment to actually improving public safety in our city, is something that we all need to care about. It, it, it's unbelievable. You represented Joe Pico. Joe P. Pico, yes, and uh, um, who has reported uh, in, uh, I think, in City Business, um, yeah. there was an uh, article with him and some, and actually some guards from from the uh, Orleans Parish Prison um, about just um, the incredibly um, horrible condi conditions inside the prison. Um, dr you know, drugs are drugs and are rampant going in and out. Um, uh, the sheriff's office. Um, the salaries there for entry-level guards and, and guards even though, who have been there for some time are incredibly low. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's just, uh, uh, it's a mess in the Orleans Parish Prison. Um, you know, and one of the problems is, is that uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Sheriff Gussman uh, would take the position that one of the solutions to that problem is that they're building a new jail, um, which may help, but if, they, if all they do is build a new jail and um, not close all of the old facilities, but simply use the new jail and the old jail facilities to increase the number of people who are incarcerated, that's not going to solve the problem. Um, and as uh, Ms. Kaplan uh, has said, we spend a lot of time incarcerating 
for short periods of time, very minor offenders or people who are just um, arrested, who are ultimately never convicted. For example, there was recently an initiative by the mayor's office um, and the police department to get judges to universally set bonds of $30,000 or more on all um, firearms cases. It sounds good. It sounds like you want to get people with guns off the street, but the reality is much different. The reality is a lot of these firearm arrests, for example, you may have one gun in a car with four young men in the car, three or four young men. The police department will arrest all four. And so you have all four of those people sitting. The gun assuredly doesn't, it, it probably belongs to one of them, but not all four. And you have lots of cases like that where you have just guns around and large numbers of, of, of um, young African-American men just arrested and rounded up. And when they spend short periods of time in jail in such, under such horrible conditions, dehumanizing conditions, and then get back out in the community. Um, I remember when I was, actually when I was in law school, um, I went to a lecture by a, uh, a warden a crim who was a criminal justice major, and the analogy he gave to what Ms. Kaplan was describing is, if a dog bites you, and you take that dog and you put it in a cage, and once or twice a day you feed it some bread and water, and you kick it a couple of times, and you do that for a year or two years or three years, and then you, let, then you open up the cage, the first thing the dog's going to do is bite you. Um, it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't do any good. And again, um, I go back to the fact that there are a small number of very serious cases and very violent crimes that do need the full weight of the criminal justice system on them. But that's not the 10 or 11 or 12,000 cases. You're talking about a couple of hundred cases. And then we've got this massive quantity of these 10 or 12,000 cases where we are doing absolutely the opposite thing and we are creating um, future criminals that are then going to come out and prey on the community and not help society. We had a couple of psychiatrists on that even discussed this whole concept of uh, most of the people in jail because of drug crimes now, you know, crack or, or, or whatever because of drug crimes. Um, first thing of it is is that we're locking people up because of drug crimes and uh, alcohol is the biggest issue as far as for uh, societal issues, health, and so forth. It's not, it's not the crack. So from both psychiatrists, they, they can explain that. We, we've selectively decided that we want to attack crack cocaine and not anything else. Uh, time is up. You guys have to come back. That's all there is to it. Chris Sylvain with Health Issues. Catch us on the web, healthissues2010.org. But go down Tulane and Broad. Just go sit in some of those courtrooms and see what's going on. Find out what your tax dollars are doing. And there's got to be some sort of uh, change. Do what you can. Fight as hard as you can.